It's a wonderful crowd, and I'm excited uh, to have you all here and have Barbara McDonald here, who's a photographer of this uh, wonderful body of work here. I wanted to first make special thanks to Kristen Peterson and Ryan Easley for uh, sponsoring the exhibit. Without um, their support, shows like this would not be able to happen here. So thank you, Ryan. Um, so a little bit about Barbara, a little bit about the show. Um, Barbara has been a long time a wonderful photographer. I've known her for many years when I was uh, first at the St. Louis Art Museum as a curator there. And she brought me work to look at. And um, she has done some really interesting, incisive bodies of work. Um, among them, this uh, very interesting group of photographs. Um, on the ex-urban landscape. Uh, she's been included in uh, many group exhibits, uh, for example, the Center for Fine Art Photography in Fort Collins, Colorado, the Minneapolis Photo Center. Um, she had a one-person show here many, many years ago, and also was an, in another group show that I had curated. Um, she most recently uh, had her work included in the fourth biennial of fine art and documentary photography in Berlin in 2016. Uh, she's had one person exhibits also at the Ellen Curley Gallery, uh, the Nature Museum in Chicago. And her photographs are included in the Midwest Photographers Project at, at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, which is a wonderful museum. If you're in Chicago and you love photography, check that out. Um, they have a whole series of portfolios by Midwestern photographers that you can look at. And Barbara, I mean, it's not a small feat to get your work included in that. So um, it's very um, wonderful that she's in that. Uh, she was also featured in Photo Review and uh, is in the permanent collections of the St. Louis Art Museum and the Museum of Westward Expansion. So I wanted to start out first um, a, to just give you a little background on the exhibit itself and how it came to be put together. Um, over the years, I've um, had photographers approach me with um, with work that was done with 19th century processes. Um, but commenting on contemporary concerns. And I began to really see kind of a, a group of work um, come together and um, thought it would be an interesting, make it an interesting exhibit. What I specifically was looking for when I did research um, to include all of these photographers was to look at photographers who weren't just using these mediums for effect or for kind of nostalgic purposes, that really there was a reason for them using the, the, that particular medium and a message that was included. So that was really the criteria. So um, there, there are certainly many more photographers that work this way, and certainly many that you know um, also fit the bill, but this was a group that kind of came together that really expressed portraiture, uh, landscape, and um, diaristic work. So um, we have these wonderful tintypes in the first room uh, by David Emmett Adams, who um, uses, um, makes these enormous tintypes of um, oil mills um, on, on actual oil drum lids. So he paints the wet collodion process onto um, onto that medium. We have several photographers in the show that use that wet collodion process. Some of them will make their original negatives um, that are usually on glass or uh, perhaps tintype um, and then scan them. And so in some cases, these are digital prints from those original negatives. And there were, um, so, so some of them are actual tintypes and then some are um, the, like the, the next generation, which would be the, the you know, the digital image. Um, we weren't able to ship all of the work. Some of them being on glass are so fragile, we really didn't want to take the chance to, to ship them. But we do have, um, Mark Katzman um, has some work here that where you can see the original um, little ambrotype, which is also a wet clothing on glass. 
So um, there's a wonderful group of uh, work here in all kinds of um, 19th century mediums. And um, so we'll start talking really um, with Barbara about um, you know, her impetus and how she got to um, decide to use um, the processes that she did, the banquet camera, for example, um, and also um, the platinum print process, which is a, a highly exacting process. I once had the great fortune of um, standing over her shoulder um, while she was making these prints in the dark room. And you know, you have to get that, that um, temperature exactly right and the time exactly right in order to get the, really the right um, levels of gradations of the, of the tone, the tonal range, so, so yeah. So Barbara, um, let's start off by really talking about why you chose to use this wonderful um, camera, this banquet camera, to make the work that you did. Or why in the world would anybody want to turn around this big thing? Because it's cumbersome and, and a little heavy, especially the tripod. And the reason is, I need a negative. You have to have a negative to make one of these prints. And the negative has to be the same size as the print because it's a contact printing process. So that's the reason. And, um, and I also like the format. I like the fact that when I get this camera out and I have my dark cloth over my head, that I look on the viewing screen and I can see the whole image. It's just remarkable. It's, it makes such a huge difference. It's, you're not looking through a little mm. hole. You're looking at all that real estate in the back. And you can make little adjustments and they make a big difference, small adjustments. I can raise the front of my camera to change the relationship of the lens to the viewing screen. Mm. I can turn it around. I can move that forward or back. There are all kinds of things you can do that make small changes. The challenge of this camera and, and doing this project, which was out in suburbia, was that I needed to drive my car everywhere. I couldn't walk around very much, and I had to find a place. If something would catch my eye while I was out on the road, I, I'd have to figure out exactly how I could get to it. I had to find a place to park the car that would be close enough. And then I would get out of the car and walk around to find a good place to put my tripod. And all of it, it, was, it just took time. This is a process that requires, the using this camera requires that you go slowly. It's kind of and a meditative process. It's a meditative process. <laughs> and I, exactly, and I can't, I have to go slowly. I can't be impulsive and I have to focus on what I'm doing. And um, so that's a big challenge with this camera. I would usually go out with two film holders, each film holder has two negatives, one on each side. And I would not even expose four negatives sometimes. I would go out all day and maybe come back with two negatives and then I'd have to process them. So it's time consuming and very exacting to yeah. it all. I mean, very, a lot of thought goes into it. I mean, when we think about our cameras, you know, and our phones, I think I have 23,000 photos on my phone. <laughs> You know, if you think about this, the sort of difference between this way of working and um, that way of working, you know, and you, the quality that you get in taking the time. And it's just another tool. I think digital is great, too. Right. And yeah. my iPhone makes amazing pictures. Right. I think it's, that's true. It's great for experimenting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I really find that I like my negatives. It's hard to get my negatives. So I bought a negative to show you what they look like. I'll just hold it up because I have to get up. Uh, I can't just sit there. So this is what one of these negatives looks like. And platinum prints and um, cyanotypes, which is these, these all are um, contact print processes. So your negative is as big as you know, the image, essentially. Exactly. So this is a negative for this particular image right here. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Which one do you want? No, let me have that negative. <laughs> okay. Or five. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> I guess I just slipped. 
And um, so I have this, this print frame, and I lay the, I make a sandwich of the, uh, the dried <coughs> paper, which is coated, and the negative, the emulsion of the negative to the coated paper. But before I've done that, I've also made test strips to make sure I've gotten everything just right. And the length of time that I expose it in my light box, usually I strive for 10 minutes. You must have had to experiment for quite some time to make sure you had the technique down. Yes, I did. I had many bad days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that the temperature outside has to be uh, above 32 degrees. I can't do it if it's really cold out for some reason. It's too humid. And if I have to make a print uh, and it's extremely cold outside, then I have to uh, use a steamer in my dark room in order to get the humidity up. I learned that because I was making, at that point, 4 by 5s because I, I didn't start making plenty of prints with this camera. I started with 4 by 5s And the, I'd make the coating, and then, and then everything would fall off. It wouldn't adhere after I process it out. So after I've exposed for 10 minutes or so, then I have a, um, what is called a printing out solution because the print is already, you can already see the print a little bit. And so you have a clearing solution, which is uh, usually ammonium citrate, which is fairly innocuous. Mm -hmm. I don't really worry about doing that breathing fumes because they're really on me, so. And then three wash baths of five minutes each, and I'm agitating. And then, then I rinse it for about 20 minutes in running water. By that time, I'm worried that the paper is going to tear, so I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> careful about it. Mm -hmm. and, and when was the process developed? Oh, I can't remember. Back in the 19th century sometime. All these processes happened at different times. So, Jim, you have a question. Yeah, when you look at the image in the camera when you're yes. in the picture. Yes. It's in color, right? Yes. You're seeing real life through there. Upside down and but backwards. But it's upside down and backwards, yeah. <laughs> Which is okay. I'm just, I'm really <laughs> come up with an image like that. So the first time you must not have any idea what is the no. actually well, I do. I, just, I, do. I, do. Yeah. Okay. I, I do. I guess I wouldn't. So the first time I had a view camera, I had a four by five, and I set it up, and I I knew I wanted larger negatives. That's how it started because I'd been making photographs of thirty five millimeter cameras, and I thought this is just so distressing because the negatives are so tiny, and I and I really like negatives, so I thought I have to have a bigger negative. So I bought a uh, used um, Graflex, Graflex and one of those ones that was used in the 50s by news photographers. And I put it on a tripod and then I looked through it and it was, everything was upside down and I thought, there must be something wrong. What did I do? Is it defective? Or? So it took me a while to get used to that. So then I went to a 5 by 7 and an 8x10 and then this is the one, my favorite camera, so that I use. Okay. Barbara, can you talk a little bit about the the way that you compose with that format in terms of the subject matter that you choose and how you decide that that's the appropriate <coughs> scene for that format? Mm -hmm. Well, it's trial and error because ultimately it doesn't matter exactly what I'm photographing. I'm not particularly concerned with the content. I am interested in photographing in general vernacular architecture and everyday life. I'm interested in what things look like in my world, um, out in suburbia in this case. And so I'm composing a, an image back there, kind of a narrative. And so I'm, that's what I'm thinking when I'm working at it. I was, so. I was thinking more along the lines about um, would you tend to back up further when you're using that camera to approach certain kinds of subjects, or would you Absolutely. exclude things where there's a lot of you know, sky effects or other things with that camera? Uh, I'm not particularly interested in sky effects so much, but I'm interested in the content um, mm -hmm. that's back in here. And I'm interested in what's in focus and what isn't, so I might make um, adjustments for that depending on the content. Usually I like everything to be in focus, and so I, I focus for the middle ground, and I have a loop, so I'm, and I'm checking corners, you know. Mm -hmm. Corners are really important. Mm -hmm. So, does that answer your question a little bit? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I'm building, I guess I'm building something back here, building a structure. Well, there is a certain level of balance to all of the images, so, you know, you're balancing everything, whether it's not 
completely centered, but there's always a kind of harmonious balance to, like you're ordering chaos in a way. Exactly, that's a good way to put it. And when I photographed that one with the little house, I wanted that post there. I think had that mm -hmm. had that not been there, I might not have taken a picture. Mm -hmm. It was important. Yeah, no, you're right. It might not be quite as interesting. And you wanted it right in the middle. The one in the middle with the little house yeah. surrounded by uh, subdivision mm -hmm. houses. And mm -hmm. this one was a struggle to get. There was so much going on, it was so noisy. And that's over by 141 and Interstate 44. And I just love that mound of dirt in that sign. It's advertising loose slots somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and then that those telephone poles were kind of going off into the distance. I thought I have to have that in the picture. Now, did you have to change the back, like the parallax of the camera in order to get the the poles to be straight? Because yes. That's one yes. beauty of these cameras is that you know when you take your just your regular camera and you shoot up at a building, you know how everything kind of gets angled? Well, Virgin. this camera has all kinds of movements in it, so you can actually straighten things out. And so... And I did. And you did. I did. That's important to have to right. straight. So, yeah. yeah. Barbara, when you say that you aren't really concerned with content and just really, as long as it's there and you can get it back there and work with it, but that doesn't like strike me as that as really true because you may not be conscious of it. But it there's is such a content that links these together. <coughs> I mean, there's a, an emptiness, a barrenness. Uh, there's banality. There's there's all the kinds of a stillness, uh, like the old you know the old <coughs> trips. Uh, the frisk to the pyramids, except it's just a like falling down building. Mm -hmm. So I think at some other instinctual level, you have a content that, that draws you. you. You're right, and there is the content that draws me, which I'm always searching for when I'm driving my car, carrying this camera. So I wasn't, you know, I didn't state that very well, but there is content, but there's also what, that's all um, kind of within me, and so that's not even stated. It's part of what I'm doing, so that's, I'm not putting it very well, but yeah, I do have a point of view, and that comes through in the pictures that I make with this camera, and the fact that I've chosen to photograph these things, even though I may not be <coughs> that moment conscious of it, because I'm, I'm so, it's so important to stay focused on what you're doing at that moment. Or, or, or I'll screw up, or I'll trip, I mean, I've tripped over this thing a few times. And <laughs> so there are all kinds of mistakes that I can make in the process of making the picture, that I'm making the picture and I'm aware of what I'm making, I really am. I am interested in the content or I wouldn't make time to do it. And then but. talk a little too about your choice of using platinum to print these images rather than a straight gelatin silver print because it, of course, gives a completely different effect. Does. Uh, does. So maybe talk a little bit about your intention um, when choosing. My intention is to seduce the viewer into looking <laughs> deeply into the pictures, to not just gaze, but to um, to look carefully and see what what I saw. Maybe. Yeah, because I want the pictures to be beautiful, but maybe the content isn't so beautiful. Yeah, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So in a way, I think at times I may elevate what I've seen. That's okay, mm -hmm. just so people notice them. I'm interested in photographing what people see but don't notice. Mm -hmm. That's that's another. That's way a perfect way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yes, this is sort of along the lines of some of the previous questions. But is there a particular light that works that you're looking for? A tonal range. That you know will work well for this medium when you tend to look for an overcast day. Like, like the Bechers always had a cloudy kind of an overcast day when they photographed mm -hmm. their water towers. So yes, they did. that um, you know, so, like a sunny, bright day. Obviously, you get a much higher contrast level mm -hmm. and shadows and harshness, mm -hmm. whereas with overcast day, one tends to you know it, it's sort of flatter maybe. I'm not a big fan of overcast days. I'm not. 
Um, and so it's sunny in almost all of my pictures. I, I like, I have some of, in this series, I have really wonderful clouds. I like clouds. Mm -hmm. But I also like, um, I like late afternoon light, mm -hmm. and I like shadows, because mm -hmm. this does well with that. Yes, you know, it's, it's ironic to me, you know, you're, you're uh, relating and enjoying sunny, and, mm -hmm. and, and but the images look like they were shot in overcast. Yeah. You know, well, so the dynamic range, I wonder about the dynamic range of that particular it has process. A, it has a big range. Yeah, it was fascinating to me because the only one that really kind of speaks to me that could be a sunny day would be the pole that intersects the, that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can kind of get that. The other ones look really kind of like overcast days to me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that that's due to that particular the process itself. Yes, yeah. it is. It looks like the medium takes it, it takes, takes it more it subtle. It does make it more subtle. And one, one other thing, too, yes. that pole that intersects that, mm -hmm. you, you're breaking the rule with that, it's beautiful. <laughs> it really, really is because you, you centered that. And, and what it's done, though, it is really the relationship to that and that building is beautiful. Yeah, it creates a tension yeah. that I think yes. without it wouldn't yes. be there. I mean, it would be a nice photo, but there, this kind of raises something inside of you when you're looking at it that, you know, maybe kind of links in with that kind of an environment, too. So, depending on your taste. Well, most of these were made in the late afternoon, yeah. after 2 o'clock. And with the exception of the one at the end, which was made in the morning. I'm not really a morning person, but I had been by there, and I needed, I needed light from the east to, to, make a, to make a statement on that wall on the far right. So and it was a January day, it was fairly warm, some years ago. And there were all these great puddles, but had I been there, I was there later in the afternoon on the previous day, and I couldn't make the picture. And I thought, well, I'll come back in the morning, and then it was it all came together then. Mm -hmm. so, I can see the highlight on the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's beautiful. And I love the way the the poles just kind of march off in the yeah. distance. So mm -hmm. anyway, the process does sort of make it look overcast. I agree, but. I really need a lot of light because I have to make a pretty beefy negative in order to make a print that works. I really like the, uh, the tones of the, of the prints because it's not grayscale, but it looks, it's all, it's not right, but I wouldn't call it black and white or grayscale, but there's, there's a very nice tone to it in, in terms of the tonal range. I really like that. There is a pretty broad tonal range, you're right. It's all, they're almost color prints. They, mm -hmm. they like, um, and the tonal ranges, or the color of each print, is affected by the developer, the, the process, the, the solution that I put over the print when I put it in a, its first bath. So ammonium citrate makes a cooler print than the other, um, the other developer that I use, which is potassium oxalate, which makes for a kind of warm print. Mm -hmm. And then you can even heat your developer and make an even warmer print. But I tend now to prefer cooler images. Do you change your formula depending on the, the content of the negative? So if you see something, a certain composition, you think maybe, oh, this would be better as a you know, higher contrast or? or well, I, I change what? my formula um, according to the contrast of the negative. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do, mm -hmm. uh, to answer your question, because I, some, and, and I, I use this table that I got from Dick Arns, Dick Richard Arns is this amazing platinum printer in Arizona. So he published a book and it has a table of formulas based on contrast. So I use his table after I lay my negative out on a light box and determine high, high values and low values and assign a number to each of them. Hmm. And then determine how many drops of each A, B, or C I should use. So, it can be complex, but it, it actually isn't that difficult. I, I've gotten used to it. <laughs> oh, at any rate. So what, how do you choose, you know, talk a little bit about what makes a good image for you? 
like what are the components in a particular image that you look for? That they not be too pretty, that they not be boring. I don't want anything that's going to bore me to death. And if I if something has grabbed me and, and I get a good negative, then I don't print it immediately. I wait around for a while and see if I still like it. Or I might even scan it and see what it looks like on the computer. Um, that's that's how I choose. It has to. Can you ever do people and faces? Yes, faces? I have. I've done group pictures. Mm -hmm. I've used this camera to do family uh, groups wow. at times and weddings. Uh -huh. time and, time. and still lives. I've used it indoors. I love doing oh, still lives, cool. but it's really yeah. fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Do you, um, when you make a print, but like I'm looking at the first one on the right, and there's a lot of light behind the mound in front. Yeah. Is any of that added to, the, or is that actually what you took a picture of? Do I work I mean, on the print do you while dodge, it's? Do you dodge? No, I don't do much of that. I mean, I could. Yeah, you could. I used, I used one time. I used a scarf mm -hmm. on top mm -hmm. of the glass, the light box. I had to make sure it didn't uh, get too close to the UVB light. Mm -hmm. But I have done things like that, but in general I don't. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a good negative that will be printable, then I don't print with it because the materials are too expensive mm -hmm. to waste. So. Mm -hmm. Are you still working on this project? Yes, I, I, I'm thinking, I've done these a few years ago. I have a few more recent ones. And I'm going out to Maryland Heights to photograph that floodplain, which is going to be developed. So that's kind of interesting to me at the moment. Yeah. And I'm tempted to go back and revisit some of these sites. It might be fun to do a rephotographic project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking that, you know, as I'm getting older and I'm so much more clumsy with things. Mm -hmm. Me too. You know, just mm -hmm. Just thinking of hand, getting that negative into the folder yeah, and laying it out and processing without scratching, without no. fingerprints. Yeah. Is it getting hard? Is it always hard, right? Well, it's always, I just have to focus on what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and I have these gray film holders, so it's actually pretty good to find that notch and get it in. I can do that. I can sit in the dark. I mean, I have, at times, when I first got this new film holder that I that I got with this camera. I, um, I mean, I sat there forever, just kind of perspiring because I couldn't get it in, and mm -hmm. I didn't have anywhere to go with it, so I had to, I had to do it. But I mean, I kind of got it in <laughs> set, so it gets easier. I don't find this that hard. I just have to focus it. Mm -hmm. I just have to be mm -hmm. on top of it. I'm not a trip over anything. <laughs> trying to get four by fives in, so I, yeah, mean, I think that's know. a pretty and big thing. And this is this long thing, <laughs> and it yeah. buckles in the middle sometimes. Yeah. I thought, oh my god. I mean, it's all kind of hard. Mm -hmm. but, but doing it over and over again really helps. Just practice makes a huge difference. So, and, if, and the fact that for a long time, I didn't photograph anything but this camera. This was the only one that I used. So that really helped. So, But if I go for a while and not use it, then I have to get back into it again and I have to remember how does this lens work because I tend to forget I have other view cameras and they have different shutters and lenses and so on and I can't remember <laughs> but anyway <clears throat> yeah it gets harder as we get older <laughs> I love digital digital is great <laughs> I'm loving it even more <laughs> so the process is you compose your, your, your photograph your picture yes on the glass. That's and right. And you put the film in place. Well, no, the first thing you do, you compose, you make the image on the glass, <laughs> you make sure it's exactly what you want. Then you stop the lens down. You have to close the, well, the lens. Is. You have to close the shutter to make sure you don't fall on your picture. So I do that, and then I then I do my settings. I take I have my um, my light meter and a gray gray card. And I, Try to get that all set, and then I bring out my uh, film holder and put it back in here, and then I cover it with a dark cloth, and and then I do the exposure when I make sure everything is nothing is vibrating. With this camera, I have another lens I use from time to time, which requires extension, 
And so I have these extension rails. And I don't use that lens very often because it's too big of a pain. But, <laughs> but then I have to make sure there's no movement at all, a little bit of wind, and, and your negative would be um, so you know, what is the typical shutter speed or exposure? Excuse me? What is the typical shutter speed or exposure? It depends on the lighting conditions. They're fairly long. Really? Yeah, half a second or so. Especially if I have the shutter or the lens stop down to say F64 or F32 or something, then I have a pretty long exposure. Which is fine. Sitting on a tripod, yeah. it can be as long as I need it to be. Hmm. Ryan, did you have a question? These pictures, Barbara, were all taken locally, how yes. far have you traveled with the camera? Um, I've traveled to California with it and made pictures there. But I was by myself and I was kind of, I mean, I was by myself and I made most of these pictures. And then I had this kind of strange <coughs> sensation when I was under the dark cloth and I heard movement behind me and I kind of had a panic attack. I thought, I think I will not be photographing alone anymore. It was too, I felt vulnerable under the dark cloth out mm -hmm. of nowhere at this point. Mm -hmm. So now I usually have somebody with me when I go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, these were mostly made locally and I have traveled to California with my camera and I, I've had my son Alex with me at times when I made some images out of California of motels. <laughs> <laughs> motels in Blythe, California. <laughs> How long does it take you to make an image? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. It takes me all day to make two prints. Okay. Because I'm doing test strips and you know, waiting for them to dry or drying them. And so it takes a while. I'm lucky if I if I make two or three, well three is a stretch, if I do two good mm -hmm. prints in a day, then that's a good day. Mm -hmm. So I I don't rush. Yes. How did you learn to do this? I, I don't think you're self-taught, but you're I, not talking about... I, am I mean, I know many people who are in the same <laughs> camera club, mm -hmm. and they do one series of um, educational sessions or travel with an expert mm -hmm. after another. And I, how did you do it? I, uh, I took a platinum plating course at Anderson Ranch Arts Center in Aspen, Colorado okay. in 1994. It was pretty intensive. We yeah. It was a small group of this wonderful teacher, Catherine Turchon, who um, was a student of Lois Connor at Yale. She was just mm -hmm. the best. She was so great. Good teacher. And so then I went home and I set up my dark room for platinum. I had been doing silver printing, but I then set it up for platinum. And it was a lot of work, but I and I had a carpenter build a light box made by made on a I had a graph or a scale model of a light box, a book that I had. So I am both self-taught and and I took a course from or a class I should say from um, Dick Arnst, yeah. and he was here one time. So that's that's the way it's been and reading books on the subject helps a lot. Do you want to talk a little bit maybe about some of your other projects, your project, some of the other oh. projects that you're doing you yeah, now? Yeah, sure. I'm photographing dioramas somewhat now. Where do you find it? In L.A. Oh. L.A. Around. Diorama. And I still need to go up to the Illinois Museum. Oh, yeah. yeah That's I do that. <laughs> so I'm doing that in color. With, and I'm using a little digital camera, which is fun. So even with a digital camera, I tend to use a tripod, though, often. Mm -hmm. So I, I need a tripod to make myself work. It's just, I just have to have one. <laughs> so I tend to use the habits that I developed and the discipline that I have with this camera with digital. That, so it's helped in a way. I don't make a lot of digital exposures. I was going to ask, like, if it's how, how does your process change with that? I just, just yeah. I'm trying to be slow in there, right. I do. Right. Yeah. So I don't have a lot of digital negatives. I still call them negatives. <laughs> Why not? Yes, sir. Do you have your own website? No, I don't. Okay. You, know, you can see some of my work in past projects on the um, 
Museum of, of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, their MPP website has, has two projects uh, on their, yeah, on their site, MPP, Midwest Photographers Project. Well. So, any other questions? Bill, do you have a question? No, oh, you're great. <laughs> That's very, very clear. Okay. Yes. You know, I'm fascinated with process. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily photographic, any creative process. Okay. And uh, one of the things I think about is uh, uh, some folks you might look for the, the final image as being the that's it. You know, I've made this creative uh, mm -hmm. expression here. But how does the process? Because what you speak about, and I am familiar with, you know, not that camera specifically, but, you know, with you, it's, it's, it's really zen. It's really, a, it's, it's, you got to be in the moment with that right there. And have you found uh, the beauty of the process itself to have as much value as the end piece? Does that make any sense? Yeah, you you're, to you're asking if it's satisfying. To yeah, yeah, or, to that. yeah, yeah, or, sure. Yeah, because it's tedious. It is tedious. It, exactly. It is but tedious. have you found a way to? Um, what's your value of that? Of that tedious kind of, or is it? But does that make any sense? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think about it that way exactly. Well, that's good. That's 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 them. Good. That's them. I don't, don't, think, I don't really right. think about right. it. Right. But I would say that each of these images is. <coughs> It's a unique print because I could I could get the naked out for any of these and make another flat print, but it won't look quite the same right. because the environmental conditions have an effect on what the print looks like. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. That was a good one. So I guess I would encourage you to look. I mean, each photographer has a method of working that really links in Kelly Anderson Staley's um, tintypes, for example. Those are all, um, she calls it Hyphen's American series. And what she wanted to do with those, for example, is um, she used the process to kind of show the trajectory and the history of like immigration in, Saint, in, in the United States and using the historic process kind of imparts um, that metaphoric level of over the work to kind of show that there's a history not only to the process, but also to the people that, you know, that there were many who came before them. So she's kind of linking those two things together. Um, and so each of the photographers you know, has done that in their own way. Um, ben Don is a really fascinating one too, over there, the leaves. Um, that's probably the sort of most building block of photography body of work that we have in the show. And what he's done is he's using, using the photosynthesis process of a leaf and um, essentially embedding an image in a leaf by virtue of photosynthesis. So she, he puts the negative directly on the leaf, much like you would here or with this, and exposes it for a couple of weeks, I think, to the sun. And as you might, you know, throw a garden hose on the grass and forget it and then pick it up and see that it's all yellow underneath, that's basically how he came to that idea. And um, so, Essentially, these images are embedded in the leaf, and he's from Vietnam, he was born in Vietnam, and the images that he uses are all found images, they're magazine photos of the Vietnam War, or military, um, military <coughs> camouflage, which, like, uh, there's a wonderful metaphor going on there. But, um, so he's essentially saying that, you know, the, the, the history of that war is is embedded in the landscape and it's embedded in all the plants and it's such a beautiful way of expressing that powerful statement um, and here very much so process and 
the message go together. It's not just process for process sake, oh look, isn't this beautiful or romantic looking or whatever. There's really a reason for why he's using that process. Um, so, you know, and each one of these photographers kind of takes that, that role um, and, and that tack with, with what they're doing. And they're so beautiful, those leaves. Right, yeah, exactly. Each one of these. Yeah, Will Wilson, <laughs> he's a Native American. He's um, a DNA a Navajo uh, photographer, um, and he's carrying on Edward Sheriff Curtis's project to document Native Americans as Curtis did. But Curtis did it from a sort of a white perspective, from an outsider's perspective, and often imparted kind of his views, nostalgia, views of nostalgia, and kind of preconceived notions about you know, Native Americans, whereas he comes from the culture, and so he has a very um, unique viewpoint, and, and so he's photographing his own community, and then what he does is he gives the original tintype to the sitter, and then has, makes the scan, and so what you see is what he has left of it. He has a reason. Right, and he just has that, yeah, that's, that's, that's his reason. Oh, and, and again, using the historical the process, historical kind history. of referencing back through history and through yes. time. Yes, yes. Yeah, so. Any questions, any more? Thank you, I wish this were at the front of the show instead of I do too. towards the mm -hmm. end. <laughs> yeah. Any well, travel so, there, you think? Not yet. I mean, I have to. I'm hoping to travel this exhibit, but um, I have to work on a proposal and get it. And I want to expand it too because I originally I wasn't able to get a daguerreotype typist in the show, and so I'm looking to expand a couple of the areas to include a few things that were yes. left out. So good. So yeah, I'm working on that. Yes. So you might have addressed this, but. Why are you especially proud of this show and consider it travel worthy? Well, I think it's, I mean, I personally haven't, I mean, there's one other um, sort of photographer who's working in this subject, but I haven't really seen any shows about this. And I mean, I think it's an interesting topic and I thought people would be interested to see you know contemporary artists who are working I mean what's what's interesting about this work is you know in this age of having everybody has a phone everybody can make pretty pictures now with their you know with their Instagram filters and the instrument Instagram filters essentially mimic all of these processes that you see here in person and so for that reason too, I kind of wanted to show how there's a group of photographers that have been kind of interested in that. Um, but again, like I said, aren't just making it for the sake of the process. They actually have something to say. Um, they have, in often cases, political, you know, or social mm -hmm. commentary in their work. Yeah. You know, the, the cyclical aspect of this kind of posting and <coughs> use of equipment. The Times recently had a story on how Instagram, some of the most popular posts, now have, quote, long captions. And they may be up to 400 words. And those, in the story, they recounted some of those. So the very mediums that make you forget to even use a full sentence mm -hmm. are now beginning to respect and maybe revere that you can express yourself in more than a photo in two words. Right. Right. And this is so much that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. When you think back on the, um, the, the time when photography really took off as a democratic medium where um, snapshot came, cameras came to being, there was actually a great interest in platinum, in gum bichromate, in very hand-oriented processes because they, these, those photographers were kind of reacting against the medium and the, the technology aspect of the medium. And they were saying, oh, photography is an art. Look, it looks just like a drawing, for example. You know, it looks like a painting. 
Um, and so, you know, I'm not saying these photographers necessarily are doing this because I don't think any of these are reactionary photographers, um, but, you know, certainly there seems to be a, a, a movement of people who are very much interested in these old processes. Yeah. I agree. Especially in today's world. Yes. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Nice to see you, Susan. You too. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you all.